uh, DA, DTP, NPTA, NPTA seminars. Um, Steve got his PhD from uh, Cambridge working with Jonathan, Jonathan Geyer. Um, and then he moved to JPL and later to Caltech. And um, well, um, I'm not going to give all the details of what he works on many, many aspects of uh, pulsar timing arrays, IPTA related. He is the chair of um, a nanograph detection uh, working group and he's also co chair of the IPTA GWA. Uh, he's also a steering committee um, member uh, from nanograph to IPTA. And of course, he's uh, interested. Uh, he is working very hard to search for, you know, to inaugurate the era of gravitational astronomy and to extract um, exciting astronomical deductions from those observations, which may have astrophysical, cosmological, and um, you know, testing GR aspects. So, and also multi-messenger gravitational astronomy. And so, yeah. So. It's a real pleasure and honor. So, Steve, um, after all this kind of tiny introduction, I'm introduced, you know, give you a handing over to you. Thanks again for agreeing to give the talk. Thank you very much, Gupu. That was a that was a very kind uh, introduction, and it's a it's an honor to speak to everyone today um, and to and to give this seminar. And also, really nice to see lots of colleagues um, on the call. Uh, hopefully we can we can have some more discussions later. So let me share my screen. Okay, so as Gopu mentioned, um, I'm going to try to give a an overview of some new results on pulsar time and array hunts for nanohertz frequency gravitational waves. I'll start by just describing pulsar time and arrays. I'm sure. Many people here know the details, but I'll, I'll give an overview and then delve into the kinds of sources of gravitational waves that we hunt for uh, with pulsar time and arrays. And the sources are primarily supermassive binary black holes. Um, I'll then give a, an overview of the state of the art results we have from Nanograv, um, which I think is the main thrust of, of this seminar to, to update you all on the recent Nanograv work. Uh, but I did want to put in towards the end some of the kind of gravity tests and exotic physics we could probe with uh, with pulsar time and array searches, and then uh, some of the work that my group is doing to push forward the future of multi messenger astronomy for the most massive black holes in the universe. Um, to orient where we are in the gravitational wave landscape, this is just a, a little infographic that compares the characteristic strain spectrum as a function of frequency for different detectors and sources. Obviously, at the highest frequencies, we've got uh, LIGO and other ground-based interferometers, uh, which are probing black holes that are stellar mass, potentially up to hundreds of, uh, of solar masses. In order to probe more massive black holes, we must go lower in gravitational wave frequency, which is the regime of LISA, the laser interferometer space antenna, which uh, is due for launch in 2034. And that should probe massive binary black holes on the scale of 10 to the four to 10 to the seven solar masses. At uh, even lower frequencies in the nanohertz band, up to hundreds of nanohertz, we have where pulsar time and arrays search for billions of solar mass black holes, billions to tens of billions of solar masses. So these are, these are the most massive black holes in the universe. and. Uh, consequently reside in the most massive galaxies. Um, and I'll give an overview of how our, our searches are going for those kinds of sources. Um, the black lines in each of these are, are trying to represent the strain sensitivity that each experiment currently has. Um, LISA is a projection, obviously, but this is the advanced LIGO design sensitivity. And then uh, this was Nanograv in 2018, actually with the 11-year the, uh, uh, pulsar timing array constraints from Nanograv 11 year data set. And then this is casting forward to Nanograv or IPTA by 2030. Um, we're hoping that by 2030, there'll be no sort of regional distinction and we'll all be working together as a unified international pulsar time and array. Uh, Stephen, Speaking can of you which, uh, explain why yes. there is this sudden drop in sensitivity, this peak uh, at this oh, 10 this to one? the, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. That's, um, that corresponds to uh, a frequency of one over a year. 
Um, and we lose sensitivity there because each of our pulsars has to have their, their sky position constraint. And so that's done by parallax and we have, to, we have to lose sensitivity at one over a year in order to do that. So you'll see this in every single pulsar time and array sensitivity curve that we've got a notch at one over a year and even one at one over six months as well, where we completely lose sensitivity. Uh, there are other reasons for the general shape of this, but they're similar to, uh, to LISA and advanced LIGO. We have competing noise effects at lower frequencies and higher frequencies. But this one is purely because we have to fit for the position of the pulsar. Okay, so you are using that uh, data using up to fit for position and that is why you lose sensitivity. Yeah, we fit for everything. We fit for everything simultaneously. It's a giant global analysis where we search for all of the timing characteristics. So there you have extra parameters. In addition. Okay, so yep. there, the peak is we have extra parameters to fit and that is why. Okay. Yep, sky location of the pulsars. Yeah, so everybody here I'm sure knows about pulsars uh, as these rapidly rotated neutron stars. Uh, we can use them as exquisite celestial clocks. Over time, we receive a train of radio pulses and we can build a very sophisticated timing model for each pulsar that includes various effects like the spin period of the pulsar, the spin down rate, uh, astrometric effects like its position on the sky and uh, also accounting for the influence of these radio pulses propagating through the ionized interstellar medium, uh, which means that lower radio frequencies are going to arrive later than higher radio frequencies. So we have to correct for that. But one thing we don't account for in the initial sort of zero order timing model is the influence of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves will change the proper separation between the Earth and the pulsar, um, meaning that the pulses will be deviated away from their expected arrival time, and they will arrive ahead of or behind schedule. Now this seems like a like a, a great opportunity to search for gravitational waves in the most exquisite timed pulsars, because we can look for uh, any deviation away from the best fit timing models. But the problem is that the signature of gravitational waves affecting these pulsars can look similar to intrinsic noise processes in the pulsars themselves. So with a single pulsar, we can never know for sure that any deviations were caused by gravitational waves there would always be some uh, lack of certainty that uh, we might be seeing intrinsic noise processes related to the pulsar or related to ionized interstellar medium effects. So this is why we don't use a single pulsar. We use an array of pulsars. And instead, we imagine ourselves like a spider sitting at the center of a vast galactic web, a timing web, and trying to feel for any correlated perturbations in that web. So you can imagine that the legs of the spider or strands of the web are like different Earth pulsar baselines. And we're timing many, many pulsars throughout the Milky Way and looking for correlated perturbations to the arrival times of the pulses. So it's really the fact that gravitational waves can correlate these timing deviations over kiloparsec scales. Um, that is the distinctive fingerprint of gravitational waves influencing pulsar timing. And so these correlation signatures between different pulsars underpin our searches for nanohertz frequency gravitational waves. Now the, the collaboration that I work, work most closely with is Nanograph, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Uh, we use primarily the Green Bank Telescope and until recently we used the Arecibo Radio Telescope. And obviously it's a, it's a great tragedy what happened to Arecibo. It collapsed in December, 2020 after a series of catastrophic cable failures. Um, but fortunately, we, uh, we still have plenty of legacy data extending 15 years in the past for our pulsar time and array campaigns. And since we are looking for low frequency signals, uh, we, can be, we can be confident that uh, that timing data is being put to good use because we're looking throughout that entire legacy data from Arecibo. Uh, more recently, we've started to look into using the VLA to do some timing campaigns with. Um, so we allowed that and not listed here, but uh, we, we do use it and we'd like to incorporate it is chime data 
from the CHIME collaboration in Canada. Now, additionally, within uh, worldwide timing campaigns for pulsars, we've got some new collaborators um, with the Indian Pulsar Timing Array, which are joining the legacy uh, Pulsar Timing Arrays of the European Pulsar Timing Array and the Parks Pulsar Timing Array. So it's a real honor that the Indian Pulsar Timing Array has very recently joined us as official members of the International Pulsar Timing Array. And uh, it's an honor to have uh, Balchandra and Gopu as representatives of the Indian PTA to the steering committee for the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, in addition to these four main Pulsar Timing Arrays shown here, Nanograv, EPTA, NPTA, and PPTA, we also have uh, timing campaigns that are in South Africa um, related to Meerkat and also FAST in China for the Chinese Pulsar Timing Array. And our goal is to synthesize all of these timing efforts together into the International Pulsar Timing Array. Uh, because if we're able to combine all of these data sets, that will immediately strengthen our ability to do precision science uh, and searches for gravitational waves. Uh, in fact, the most recent IPTA meeting was in Pune. Um, that was the last time all of our colleagues uh, were able to meet in person. Um, and thank you again for hosting that. Right, so moving on to the kinds of sources we would expect uh, pulsar timing arrays could be sensitive to. And as I mentioned at the start, these are the most massive binary black holes in the universe. Um, our sensitivity in frequency space to gravitational waves is set by how we're sampling the pulsar time series. With decadal timing campaigns, we get down to roughly one over a decade or one over a few decades, and that's currently at about two nanohertz. And then if we're sampling the pulsar time series every few weeks, um, that gets us up to roughly Nyquist sampling of a few hundred nanohertz. And within that band, we have a cosmological population of uh, in spiraling supermassive binary black holes, which should be a natural byproduct of hierarchical galaxy formation over cosmic time where small galaxies merge to form larger galaxies. And within each of those galaxies, there is a, a massive black hole, uh, which will eventually find the other black hole um, and move to very small separations where it will emit gravitational waves in the relevant sensitivity band for pulsar timing arrays. These signals should manifest in several different ways. Um, initially, we expect that the entire population of binary black holes will be detected as a confusion background, a stochastic gravitational wave background. We won't be able to resolve all of the sources uh, individually. However, over time, we might be able to resolve the most massive or nearby sources that are resounding above the level of the background. And so we do search for single resolvable binaries. The signal model here is rather straightforward. These, uh, these uh, systems are mega years potentially away from coalescence. So for circular systems, we can model them to leading order as sinusoids, um, but Gopu and Abhimanyu and Loki have been uh, working very hard on developing robust eccentric signal models as well. Now pulsar timing arrays lack the higher frequency sensitivity to detect the oscillatory part of the gravitational wave merger. Um, that would be at too high frequencies for pulsar timing arrays but we could detect the gravitational wave memory burst, which uh, would be seen as a step function in strain and a ramp function in timing deviations. Um, so that is something we can search for, an indirect signature of the gravitational wave memory burst, which is the low frequency part, kind of a step function offset um, that's present in the merger waveform. But we can't measure the actual oscillatory cycle part of it. Now, this is showing a, a little video which demonstrates the process I mentioned before of how uh, a gravitational wave will interact with an Earth pulsar system, stretching and squeezing the space time and affecting the timing uh, of the pulsars and the regularity of the pulses. Uh, but our detection, as I mentioned, is not based on the timing of one pulsars, 
in order to unambiguously claim detection of the stochastic background of gravitational waves, which we hope to detect first, that has to be based on cross correlations between many pulsars. Um, and that is the distinctive fingerprint of gravitational waves affecting the timing of our pulsars. This little video here shows that process where we have a background of gravitational waves, many, many sources affecting three pulsars. And the color of the stars of the pulsars um, are shown below and the corresponding time series of timing deviations in the pulsars is shown. It looks like a stochastic process, but the important point to take away here is that it's correlated between the different pulsars. And the strength of the correlation is directly proportional uh, to a function that depends only on the angular separation between the pulsars in the sky. And that function is called the Hellings and Downs curve. It's the equivalent of the overlap reduction function for pulsar timing arrays. It's quadrupolar in shape, um, corresponding to the quadrupolar antenna response pattern for PTAs. And as we separate pulsars more and more on the sky, this correlation pattern will go negative and then become positive again. Now it won't entirely recover because the pattern is not entirely quadrupolar. It still has power at octopole and beyond, but it's predominantly quadrupolar in, in shape. So uh, Stephen, did someone have it, a question? Uh, yeah, it does not depend on uh, the direction from which the gravitational wave is coming from? Um, this is for an isotropic stochastic background. Oh, okay. So if it, were an, if it were an anisotropic background, then yes, it would be a directional dependence on the actual power distribution. Uh, but for here, for isotropy, it only depends on the angular separation of the pulsars due to symmetry. Um, but certainly we have anisotropy searches that, uh, that we're hoping to perform. And indeed for individual searches, for, sor for searches for individual um, sources, we do have an additional directional dependence. We model these deterministic signals with some dependence on the sky location. But for our initial searches for a stochastic background, we will assume isotropy, which is an appropriate assumption. It's, it will take us through the era of the first detection. And uh, that produces a very simple signal model for us, very simple template for the cross correlations. Also from the cartoon that you saw, showed, it seems that uh, the wavelength of the gravitational waves is much larger than the separation between Earth and the pulsar. Uh, is that right? That's a, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, a very, very outdated and inaccurate graphic that needs to be replaced. Uh, but unfortunately, no one- So the wavelength is uh, much smaller. So I forgot, so nanohertz is how much? It is like light years, a uh, few hundred light Yes, years. it is. We're talking, we're, we're talking light years, yeah. And, you know, the reason why that is important is because we need, um, in order to accurately model the gravitational waveform, um, there are, there are several aspects to that, but we need the, the distance to the pulsars to be known to, uh, to sub wavelength precision, sub gravitational wavelength precision, which is going to be sub light year in some cases. So if we, if we do want to model individual sources of gravitational waves well, and pull out sky locations and properties of individual sources, uh, then we'll need very uh, sub wavelength precision on uh, the pulsar distances. Okay, so when the wavelength of the gravitational wave is much shorter than the earth pulsar distance, then I would assume that there might be cancellation. The pulsar may get ahead at some point when it passes the trough of the wave, and it may pass a, a crest and then, so there might be cancellation between, uh, you know, uh, the pulse getting ahead and getting behind. Yeah, there could be, I mean, there could be cancellation. It's, so it does, it's an does that make the position of many waves. So does that make the, uh, the, does it affect the sensitivity curve at low frequencies? Does it make the sensitivity worse? Or no, it's not important. No, the, the, the sensitivity curve at low frequencies that you saw where it seems to diminish in sensitivity at lower frequencies, that's almost entirely due to the fact that we have to search for the period and the period spin down of the pulsars which is a quadratic that we have to fit and subtract. Uh, and thus we completely lose sensitivity at those lower frequencies. Yes, so you don't have to worry about these cancellations between. 
if you pass many wavelengths. No, no, we we don't uh, we don't worry too much about that. I mean, there will be cancellation because we're dealing with an incoherent superposition of many many waves from many many sources, um, but it doesn't entirely wash out. No. Yeah, so, so many pulsars are needed uh, to. Sorry, yep. can I can I interrupt for a question? Sorry, uh, sure. just wondering. Uh, um, so, in the absence of a stochastic stochastic background, is this is this uh, correlation just a flat line at zero, or is there some correlation due to the ISM or something? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in the absence of gravitational waves, this should be uh, consistent with a flat line at zero. Yes, there'll be some random noise fluctuations, but yes, it should be zero. I see, um, and, and then just to get a context, you showed a 2018 nanograv sensitivity curve at some point previously. Uh, how mm -hmm. many pulsars does that assume? Yeah, the nanograv 11-year um, pulsar timing limits use 34 pulsars. I see, great, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and the, the 45 pulsar results that I'll show you pretty soon use uh, the, the 45 pulsars from the, the nanograv 12 and a half year data set. Thanks. Uh, but we're quick. We're quickly expanding the arrays. We're we're almost at 60 to 70 pulsars now in the IPTA. Um, no. So related to the question that you just asked, whether this would be consistent with zero, um, there are possible noise processes and, and systematics that could uh, also produce some sort of spatial correlation pattern, some sort of pattern that uh, would uh, would correlate the pulsars. Um, that would be any uncertainties in the solar system ephemeris. So we have to reference our pulsar timing observations back to the quasi-inertial reference frame that is the solar system barycenter. And to do that, we use uh, ephemeris models that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory produces or equivalently um, the uh, INPOP team that's in France. Um, they fit an ephemeris model to legacy spacecraft data and more modern data as well using Juno and Galileo. Um, and they build a giant model of the solar system uh, is, in uh, order to Stephen, reference. Uh, can you explain what is solar system ephemeris? Or for the non -astronomers? Yeah, sure. The solar system ephemeris is a model of the masses and trajectories of all of the major dynamical objects in the solar system. And the reason why you need that is because you want to be able to compute the center of mass of the solar system, the position of the center of mass. Um, and that's important because you want to reference your time and observations back to that reference frame, which is our equivalent quasi-inertial reference frame. Um, now that's, that's fine, you can do that. The problem is that this ephemeris model that JPL and other teams produce is updated and the updates between them can introduce systematics and that can lead to spurious, uh, spurious correlations between the pulsars. And in fact, if your ephemeris model is somehow systematically offset from the true solar system ephemeris, uh, then what happens is you'll induce spurious dipole correlations between the, the timing of the pulsars. So if there were a whopping big ephemeris uncertainty, solar system ephemeris uncertainty between your pulsars, then the correlation that would be produced would be dipolar, which means that we'd start off somewhere up here, and we'd go down here. So it would just be dipolar. Now we have ways of mitigating that. We, we build ephemeris, um, we build our own Bayesian solar system ephemeris within our codes. And in fact, the more recent models that JPL and other teams are producing seem to, uh, seem to actually mitigate this um, themselves. So we're not too worried about ephemeris systematics at the moment. Uh, one other possibility is that, you know, we have to reference our pulsar timing observations back to a global timing standard. That global timing standard is produced from lots of national timing standards, and those national timing standards are produced from observatory timing standards, which have their own clock definitions and their own atomic clocks. Um, now that's, this, that, I can possible. ask a question. So these ephemeris programs assume GR is the correct theory of gravity, right? 
or uh, yes. is it just Newtonian gravity sufficient? I think Newtonian gravity, well, no, Newtonian gravity wouldn't be sufficient for Mercury. Um, so no, it's, there'd be post-Keplerian uh, and post-Newtonian corrections. Um, they, do a, they do a big global fit for all, all of the planets and all of the asteroids that, that can be isolated. So it's, it's fairly accurate. So the assumption is the GR is valid on solar system scales, all these ephemeris programs, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know of anybody working to do MOND corrections or anything to, to uh, these ephemeris models. All right, so yeah, to finish off what I was mentioning about uh, possible clock errors, um, if there were clock errors that were affecting all of our pulsars, then those would be present as the same realization of the clock systematic in all of the pulsars, because all of the pulsars are referenced to a global timing standard, and there might be some long time scale drift in those timing standards. And what that would look like would be a monopole. It would just be a flat line that would be offset from zero in this. Um, so clock systematics, solar system ephemeris systematics, they both look very different from the kind of cross-correlation signature we expect for gravitational waves, which is this nice quadrupolar pattern. Um, even more so, this quadrupolar pattern here uh, can be shown to be mathematically orthogonal to dipole and, uh, and monopole uncertainties. So we're, we're fairly confident we can mitigate those effects. To give you an idea of the detection timeline we're expecting, we are expecting that within the next few years, we'll have robust evidence for stochastic gravitational wave background, which is the aggregate of all of the signals from all of the binary black holes uh, throughout the universe. And then a few years after that, hopefully by the end of this decade, we'll be able to resolve bright individual sources out of that background, because this background is really just many, many sources um, producing gravitational waves together. So there'll be some Poisson fluctuations and perhaps there'll be a bright binary that can stick up above the level of this background and we'll be able to find it uh, and fully characterize its orbital uh, parameters. All right, so I've kept you waiting long enough and let me tell you about some of these state-of-the-art results from Nanograph. Uh, this is the Nanograph 12 and a half year data set um, within which we searched for an isotropic stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, it uh, went public in September 2020, and we've had 102 citations since then. It's now published in uh, Astrophysical Journal Letters and was led by one of my colleagues, Joe Simon at JPL. Now it's to you, Boulder. The big result is that we found a common spectrum, low frequency process in all of our pulsars. What that means is, we have 45 pulsars that we've searched within. Um, those 45 pulsars have a maximum time and baseline of 12.5 years. And what we found is in addition to the intrinsic low frequency noise in each of those pulsars, there appears to be an additional common low frequency uh, red noise process that's shared amongst those pulsars. And what's more, the spectral signature of that process, that low frequency process, is broadly consistent with expectations for the spectrum of, uh, of gravitational waves from supermassive binary black holes. Uh, now, let me just parse what you're seeing here on the left-hand panel. In the left-hand panel, this is showing essentially the residual power spectrum of the data that we have. Um, the gray regions are showing essentially a periodogram of the common noise amongst all of the pulsars. So these correspond to different frequencies that we're sampling. One over T, so one over 12.5 years, two over 12.5 years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the lowest five frequencies are fairly well constrained and are well modeled by our power law. But if we include additional higher frequencies in our analysis, um, there appears to be unmodeled noise, which is muddy in the waters and making it difficult to infer. And so if we include those additional frequencies, the power law fit gets much shallower. And so it's biased in some way. Uh, Stephen, uh, 
don't these high frequency points uh, seem consistent with zero? Or... The points at these high frequencies above 10 to the minus eight, uh, are they above zero or significantly above zero or is this amplitude consistent with zero? We're measuring something. Yeah, there are some here that certainly seem to show significance. But and we think that could be unmodeled. Yeah, that could be unmodeled uh, receiver noise or it could be unmodeled uh, ISM noise. Uh, but the point is we're essentially doing a filter on those higher frequencies and only considering the lowest few frequencies, the lowest five frequencies in the analysis. Okay. And that's well fit by a power law. So where will be your sensitivity but, curve be here in this plot? Sensitivity curve would, it would, um, well, it would kind of look like if I was to swoop it down like that, kind of look like that. We would get okay. the greatest sensitivity to individual frequencies at about 10 to the minus eight hertz. Okay, so the points above 10 to the minus eight will all be below your sensitivity curve. So they will be- Yeah, so we nice. don't we don't think these are, these are just spurious noise fluctuations that are unmodeled. So we need to do a better job of modeling them, but we can isolate ourselves from them by only considering these lowest frequencies. Great, thanks. Now, if we lock the shape of this spectrum to the theoretical expectations for a supermassive binary black hole background, we can extract a, a power law amplitude uh, for that process. And that the process amplitude is shown in the right-hand panel here. Uh, we call it a common process because we can't claim that it's gravitational waves. I'll explain that more in the next slide, uh, in the next few slides. But the amplitude of this, um, of this common process does seem quite loud, um, but still consistent with theoretical models of the supermassive binary black hole population. The amplitude, the median amplitude is roughly 1.9 times 10 to the minus 15. You're seeing different curves here because um, these are produced, the solid ones are produced in a Bayesian analysis, which used one of the JPL or one of the INPOP solar system ephemeris models. The dashed lines are in a Bayesian analysis where we've perturbed away from those solar system models and actually done our own model of the solar system simultaneously with our gravitational wave analysis. Regardless of doing that, it doesn't affect our results dramatically and we're still detecting something quite strongly. It's common amongst the pulsars. So Stephen, uh, just to understand uh, this again, uh, are you seeing the quadrupole correlation here as a function of the pulsar separation? We are not, we're not. Um, and what we're does seeing... that imply for this uh, then? Sure, and I'll get onto that in two slides time. Um, I'll discuss the cross correlations, but for the moment, we're seeing, the, we're seeing some sort of autocorrelated process that is in common across the pulsars. It's spectrally common, um, which is thought to be the first sign of an emerging gravitational wave background. The autocorrelations will be a strong first sign. And then the cross correlations, which are much weaker, should emerge later. So this actually works with our timeline of expectations for the emergence of a signal. We should get this kind of uh, common spectrum process first, followed by uh, evidence for the cross correlations. Okay, great, thank you. So a natural question in doing this uh, analysis is how common is this common spectrum process? Um, and to answer that, we can do an analysis called dropout, which is essentially just leave one out cross validation. We test the extent to which each pulsar is supporting the uh, detection of a common process in the other n minus one pulsars. And within this analysis, if we just take one pulsar out, fit for a common process, and then see how that is consistent with the pulsar we took out, um, we can compute something called the dropout ratio. Dropout ratio is really just a base factor for the presence of a common process in this pulsar uh, versus not being present. So here we have all of the pulsars we use in our analysis. Don't worry too much about the various colors here. Um, if you want to focus on one of them, you can focus on the blue. 
um, the blue is our default choice for the analysis. And it shows that approximately 10 pulsars are strongly supporting this common process. Uh, the majority of the other pulsars are ambivalent. They don't really care. They're giving a dropout ratio of one, which means they don't care either way. And then there are a few pulsars that seem to disfavor this common process, um, which is fine. But one of those pulsars that disfavors it is actually one of our best timed pulsars um, called J1713 plus 0747. Um, now we think the reason why it's disfavoring the common process in this data set is because um, very close to the end of its timing period in this data set, there was a there was a, a transient interstellar medium event which affected its timing. Um, so if we switch out the data set for that pulsar and replace it by an earlier data set that uh, that was cut off before that interstellar medium event, uh, we get this green dashed line over here. So this is the 12 and a half year data set version for that pulsar, which is really well timed. It should agree with the common process, but this unmodeled ISM event or poorly modeled ISM event seems to be uh, causing some, some issues uh, because we're, we're not doing a good enough job of modeling that. So if we just cut off the last bit of data and replace it with um, an 11 year data set, so we're just getting rid of the last bit of data, which suffered this noise process, then we get this green hollow point, which is actually now consistent with the common process. It's got a dropout ratio of greater than one. So this gives us confidence that we can get our best 10th pulsar to, uh, to agree with this common process if we do a better job of um, modeling the noise. Uh, so Stephen, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah. So uh, why is why are the orange points so significantly different from the blue and green points, uh, especially for the pulsars which are best supporting this hypothesis? Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a great question. So the orange points are an analysis with Bayes FM. Bayes FM is our Bayesian solar system ephemeris model, where um, we have searched over the orbital parameters of Jupiter and the masses of the gas giants in addition to modeling the gravitational wave signals. The reason why we've done that is to uh, correct for any possible solar system ephemeris systematics. Now that, that does correct for any possible solar system ephemeris systematics, but it's also an additional set of parameters that could be covariant with the gravitational wave signal or the common process signal. And so what that does is it just reduces the dynamic range of the dropout ratio and uh, makes them all less significant than they are. So all of the dropout numbers that come from, um, from the base FM results are, you know, squashed. They're less, they're less dynamic than, uh, than if we did a fixed ephemeris analysis. I see. Thank you. Uh, so just one other quick question. Um, as you mentioned for J1713, there was a, a ISM event. Uh, mm -hmm. Along similar lines, are there um, so when you have, take data from over twelve years, instruments change, instruments uh, the, your uh, backends will be upgrading, and you have different timing residuals and timing properties. So, do you do jackknife tests across uh, different uh, years along time so that you can make sure that the signal has been present in both uh, sets of data? Yeah, that again is a great question. We haven't done jackknife tests, but we do a we do slice analyses, um, which might actually be consistent with what you're talking about. Um, my my postdoc here at Vanderbilt, Nihan Paul, has been doing lots of analyses where he sliced the data set um, either in increase in increments, building from small time scales up to the entire data set, or he's actually done it um, in the reverse order, where, he, where he's taken the entire data set and then just you know chopped off earlier times as well. And the idea is to show the emergence of this, of this signal over time. Um, we can't slice the data too finely because it is a very low frequency signal. So if we just looked in one year segments, we would not see it. Right. We really need decadal time scale. So just to follow up on that, uh, what was the interstellar ev medium event and how was it identified uh, and how do we know we are not missing other such interstellar events? Maybe it's just my ignorance. So, yes. 
Yeah, so this Pulsar 1713 had uh, one very notable other interstellar medium event. And it was a, a transient event that lasted maybe six months to a year. Um, it's been modeled in various ways, but essentially it appears as if there, there was a void in the interstellar medium where the, the dispersion measure dropped over uh, several months and then recovered again. Um, it's been modeled as an exponential dip in the dispersion measure. It's been modeled just with piecewise polynomials. Um, Nanograv's technique for modeling uh, time-dependent dispersion measure is just by having um, uh, an epoch-dependent offset in the DM, which is being fit for in addition to the other time and model parameters. So we it was identified through time-dependent um, DM offsets. And um, we think we can do a much better uh, job of modeling these kinds of features. Um, we have an active program at the moment, which is doing advanced noise modeling of many of our pulsars, uh, because they should all be treated independently and in a custom fashion. Um, other DM events are just the solar wind. We have to be able to model the, the solar wind, the fact that some pulsars line of sight gets very close to the solar wind. And so we have to model sudden spikes in the, in the electron density. Um, and even beyond dispersion, we have to model other chromatic effects, um, such as you know, scintillation and scattering. And uh, that is something that we're looking into at the moment. Thank you. All right, so now moving on to the cross correlations. So everything I've shown you so far is measuring the spectral properties of this common process. Um, and those spectral properties are very loud. We're, we're, we're definitely getting um, something that is a, a common spectrum process amongst the pulsars. However, this common spectrum process does not yet have significance in the cross correlations in order for us to claim detection of the gravitational wave background. So we are able to probe the cross correlations between the pulsars. Uh, you're seeing in the top left, um, the cross correlations between the pulsars in the previous data set, which is the Nanograv 11 year data set. These black points here are not the raw cross correlations between the pulsars. They're actually binned to make it easier to see. Um, the horizontal line is just a flat line for reference that shows a monopole, kind of flat monopole that you would get from a clocker. And then the uh, blue dashed is the best fit Hellings and Downs cross correlation curve. As we move to this data set, the Nanograv 12 and a half year data set, Nothing much changes dramatically, except that the uncertainties get a little bit tighter. Um, but again, it's not significant enough and not close enough to the Hellings and Downs curve in order for us to claim that we have quadrupolar correlations between the pulsars. Um, the image on the right is to show that we can do this in a Bayesian analysis as well. Stephen, can yes. I ask, uh, so each point here, is it a pair of pulsars or is it uh, many pairs of pulsars? It's same it's many pairs of pulsars. With same yeah. it's many pairs. Many, many pairs of pulsars. So in, in this lower image here, uh, we have 45 pulsars. So it's 45 by 44 divided by two pairs. Um, and in this analysis up here, it's 34 pulsars. So it's 34 by 33 over two pairs. And it's just binned here for easy, you know, aesthetic representation. Now the image over here is just to show that we can do this kind of cross correlation analysis in a Bayesian way as well. These images here are frequentist recoveries uh, using a, an optimal statistic, an optimal estimator. But we can do this within our Bayesian pipelines as well, uh, which means that we can do it in a giant global analysis of many hundreds of parameters. Um, that accounts for the cross correlation pattern between the pulsars. Again, we're seeing that there's no distinctive uh, trend for the quadrupolar correlations here yet. If we assume that we have Hellings and Downs correlations between the pulsars and do model comparison with a, with a model that doesn't have any correlations, then our Bayesian odds ratio is about two to four, uh, depending on the, the solar system ephemeris modeling that we do. So two to four odds versus one are really nothing to write home about. It's not significant. Um, so we don't have distinctive evidence of the cross correlations yet. So Stephen, in your previous plot, uh, in the previous slide, 
So this 10 to 11 pulsars are the ones which are showing the strong common uh, spectrum process, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any uh, correlation between those pulsars that maybe they are in one part of the sky or is there anything special about those 11 pulsars? Have you looked or they are just- uh, Not particularly. No, not particularly. They just happen to be the, the longest time pulsars and the best time and quality pulsars. Um, but we, we can't just choose our best pulsars to do detection. Um, we need we need many many pairs of pulsars in order to claim the detection. I was just wondering if there was we... something special uh, in those pulsars which distinguishes them from other pulsars, or they are just random uh, samples of population. Yeah, I, the, they're only special because they've been timed the longest, and uh, they happen to be well timed pulsars. They have a good time and precision. Okay. Are they also the closest? That is why you have uh, longest times for them? Are they the closest? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, regardless of whether they're the closest or not, they're still uh, hundreds of parsecs, if not kiloparsecs away. Okay. And the, yeah. the precision on the distance measurements is not good for any of these pulsars. Yeah, they're not particularly uh distributed in in distances if that's what you mean but uh, uh, to get a good precision because millisecond pulsars are very weak radio sources you typically choose nearby pulsars so so there is they are all nearby pulsars but uh, it's not that the best ones are the nearest compared to the not so right. best ones Okay, so time is time is moving on, and I'll I'll uh, finish off my discussion of the state of the art with this slide. Um, we can we can get a measure of how often the uh, the actual base factor or Bayesian odds that we that we measure can happen by accident by by spurious fluctuations in the noise. Um, so LIGO and other ground-based interferometers have time slides where they just offset the time um, of the recorded data and find out how often we get spurious noise correlations. Uh, the way that we do this in pulsar timing arrays is by uh, scrambling the overlap reduction function template or scrambling the phase between, uh, between the time series. And what that does is it, it operates on our real data set and destroys any possible inter-pulsar correlations in the data set. And we can do that many Stephen, I think we lost you. Yes, uh, I can't yes. hear him either. Yeah, I, I guess we have lo lost him. If he just wait, I think he comes back. Uh, hopefully he will connect back. It's quite very, very interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I cancel my class, or actually, I said I'll join late, but I think I'll cancel it. So. I think we can stop the recording for the time being, or is yeah, I can to talk about was the one that dealt with the uh, the actual distribution of the null hypothesis of base factors. And we did that, as I mentioned, with, with uh, phase shifts and scrambles, ways of operating on the data um, that destroy any potential correlations, spatial correlations between the pulsars in the real data set. Um, what we found there is uh, if we create this distribution of uh, the null hypothesis, then our true base factor that we measure in the data set has a p-value of about five to 10%. Um, so that's obviously very, very large for a p-value, uh, which tells us that the significance of our cross correlations for Hellings and Downs correlations in our data uh, are, are not very high. So in the nanograph 12 and a half year data set, we currently don't have strong evidence for the cross correlations between the pulsars, uh, but we do have strong evidence for the emergence of a common spectrum process, which uh, could be the first sign of a gravitational wave background. 
and we'll know for sure within the next year or two, uh, once we're able to more adequately assess the cross correlations, we need additional time and additional pulsars to see whether we can tease out the signal of the cross correlations. Okay, Stephen, so assuming that this common process is from gravitational waves, so uh, uh, when will you expect that you will have enough signal to noise to get the cross correlation confirmation? Will it take one year, two years? Or... So I'm an optimist, but even being a pessimist, I would say that it's only two years. Well, see, um, time, we should have confirmation whether it is gravitational wave or not. Yes, I would say within the next year to two, We'll have, we'll have confirmation whether it's gravitational waves or not. Um, now we can, we can do additional tests in the meantime because uh, there are other pulsar timing arrays that are doing this. Uh, for example, the International Pulsar Timing Array uh, already combines data from uh, admittedly older data sets, but still once you bring them all together, they, they make a data set that seems to be stronger and more informative than the nanograv 12.5 year data set. Um, so that analysis is ongoing, but it seems to report something that is um, consistent with the nanograv 12.5 year results. Um, so that's an independent confirmation from the International Pulsar Timing Array. And we expect that that result will be out within the next, uh, within the next three to six months. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Pranav Khosh. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, the question I had was about the synergy between nanograv observations and the next generation VLA observations. And the reference was to a slide that I think Steve never had a chance to show. It compares the characteristic strain profiles expected from gravitational waves emitted by supermassive black hole binary squalicing and the sensitivity of the nanograv. The, the question is as follows: That seeing how the uh, how the sensitivity compares with the strain profile, which has signatures of binary hardening processes like three-body scatterings and with galaxy bulge stars and interactions with circumbinary disks, the power law has the very interesting behavior that it changes from the physician minus two-thirds power or a turnover at the lower frequency end and at the higher frequency mm -hmm. profile depends on things like extensive distribution and so on. So in this context, the, my question was, what would be the role of synergy between nanograv and NGVLA observations? In particular, how can they complement and inform each other and shed light on that, that question? Yes, that, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so just to clarify, are you, are you asking about NGVLA being used to time pulsars or NGVLA as a, an electromagnetic instrument to probe uh, the central regions of galaxies? No, the, 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 my interest is if you have observations from NGVLA on the questions of how supermassive black hole binaries would behave, these aspects that I sort of uh, said in a few words, yeah. that would yeah. be the thing to compare with. Yeah, definitely. Um, so NGVLA um, is going to be an extraordinary instrument to probe the, the central regions of galaxies. And uh, hopefully we can get down to separations that are, that are small enough of black holes that we can actually see what kinds of environments these supermassive black hole binaries are embedded in. Because as you, as you rightly pointed out, they're interacting with, with uh, stars in centrophilic orbits. They're act interacting with lots of gas produce circumbinary disks and there could be some eccentricity involved as well as you said all of these various factors will influence the shape of the spectrum and so if we can get some sort of prior knowledge of uh, kinds of astrophysical environments that these got that these black holes are in then yes we can build expectations for how the characteristic strain spectrum of the background should turn over at lower frequencies right exactly. uh, that is yeah that is that is a really that is a really exciting prospect for the future uh, it's one of the chief scientific milestones for pulsar timing arrays in the next 10 years, being able to characterize the shape of the strain spectrum and look for final parsec dynamical interactions uh, yeah. um, yes, in, yes, in, yes. That, in that strain yeah. spectrum. That famous yeah. final parsec problem, yes. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, yeah. 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 Thank you, 
uh, I just want to add that uh, the, the same scenario, not with gravitational waves, but the NGEHT, this is a new concept being pushed um, around 200 million kind of uh, deal. Um, uh, they are also trying to look into uh, this uh, possibility of seeing whether there are you know, uh, binaries and that are interacting with circum um, uh, stellar uh, you know, processes to drive eccentricity and all that. Uh, so there was a meeting a couple of weeks back and it, this is also push the... Sorry, uh, can you explain what is the, Stephen, what is and this NGEHT is the next generation EHT? That's right, uh, but uh, Pranav of, and Steve was talking about NGVLA. Uh, that's the, uh, you know. What is that? Well, I think they will so, explain. It. Yeah, the they next generation, very large array, which is uh, a design concept at the moment. Okay. Okay, so let, let me ask uh, one more question. Uh, so suppose, uh, uh, you know, the cross correlation finds that it is not gravitational waves. And are there non gravitational wave ex explanations for this common, uh, uh, this common signal that we are seeing? For example, mm -hmm. can it be something interesting to pulsars, some jitters in that all pulsars have that we are detecting now or related to pulsar environments because they are in some complicated environments? Yeah, it, it, it could be a variety of things. Um, you know, we, I explained that it, there are possible signatures of, of being dipolar correlations or monopole correlations. Uh, and those would be created by, by solar system ephemeris errors or clock errors. But we, we, don't, we don't really think those could be strong sources of, of systematics. Um, but there could be, there could be some uh, common intrinsic processes within pulsars, within our millisecond pulsars, that are manifest in noise on similarly long time scales and produce similar uh, low frequency signatures. Um, that is certainly a possibility. Whether they would be, you know, so strongly reinforcing of each other and, and so similar, we don't know. Uh, we just don't have a good handle on the distribution of noise properties in millisecond pulsars on long time scales uh, to judge that. So it, it's still very much an open question, but. Um, but what we can answer, we can answer is whether we actually find the quadrupolar correlations or not. Uh, and we'll know that within the next year or two. So uh, Steve, I have a tricky question. Uh, so this Go is ahead. about the 100 citation you mentioned about. Uh, uh -huh. Let me see, how do you rule out those 75 citations uh, they are going to use all sorts of theories and uh, particle <laughs> physics? <laughs> <laughs> that will take um, a century, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, I, I, I did want to reference, um, <laughs> I did want to reference something that's called Betteridge's Law of Headlines. I think there's a scientific equivalent, um, which uh, which says that if if a question is asked in the title of a paper, then the answer <laughs> is usually no. And there are many, there are many, many uh, papers that are related to cosmic string interpretations, uh, primordial gravitational wave interpretations, dark matter interpretations uh, of the nanograph result. And um, I mean, they're all, they're all solid theoretical work, but they're all highly speculative as well. Um, what, what we'll probably see will be supermassive black hole binaries producing the spectrum. That's the most vanilla, the most boring, but the most, um, the most likely uh, source of the signal. Um, so yeah, um, a good lot of those are are more speculative sources, and I hope that no one here wrote any of them. And if they did, I apologize. I think we should let uh, Steve go and sleep. Um, it's uh, it's getting fairly late. Um, so. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And oh, no, I do no, apologize. No, no, no. I don't know. No, no, it's not. I, I haven't. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. We are going to formally thank you, but I'm just uh, making a comment. Um, uh, Rishi, um, would you? I think, yeah, it was a very nice talk, and I don't see any more questions. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I mean, uh, the real 
you know, deliverable was missing uh, visually, but uh, we really enjoyed. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to have other talks at convenient time. So yeah, and hope to see you around too. So thank you very much. Really appreciate. And thank you from all of us too. So. Thank you very much, Gopi. It was uh, it was an honor. And uh, to make up for the last slides not being visible, I will send a PDF uh, copy of the slides to you or to Rishi and make sure that they're available if people want to see them.